My name is Barbara Mulvihill, and today I'm talking with Jim D. Nelson. Today's date is July 3rd, 2018, and we're in the Campbell Room of the Salina Public Library. Mr. Nelson, could you please state your full name? My name is uh, Jim Davis Nelson. And what branch of the service were you in? I was drafted in 1967. I was drafted in the U.S. Army. The Army. And I was trained as an infantryman at Fort Bliss, Texas, and then at Fort Polk, Louisiana. And uh, what is the highest rank you attained? I attained the rank of Spec 4, which was equivalent to Corporal. I was offered Buck Sergeant, but I turned it down. Um, what war or conflict did you serve in? I was in the Vietnam War in 67 and 68. And you said you were drafted. Could you tell us a little bit more about uh, what happened and how you entered the service? I entered the service uh, at Boulder, Colorado, where the draft board uh, selected me to be inducted. Uh, I was in New York City at the time working for Raymond Loy. Uh, the famous industrial designer. He designed uh, the, uh, uh, did a lot of the streamlining for Pennsylvania Railroad. He designed the Coca-Cola bottle, designed Skylab. He designed uh, the uh, presidential aircraft colors for JFK, did the Shell Oil sign, was world famous for his industrial design. I was one of his three mural painters and I did Western murals for big department stores, uh, basically May Company out of Chicago, May DNF and Famous Bar. And I was drafted. Uh, I was making very good income, and I was drafted. I uh, had a studio on Fifth Avenue right across from the Metropolitan Museum. And I then uh, got my uh, greetings from uh, the President of the United States, Johnson. You're from here in Kansas. Yes, I was born right? in Beloit, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And then how how did how had you gotten to uh, how had you made your way into the your career as an artist? Well, uh, I I plowed for my grandmother after my grandfather died. I would do the plowing and field work starting at fourteen. Also worked for um, did some field work for my aunt and her husband Clifford and Mary Culp up in Jewell County, and uh, I always liked uh, coming to uh, Kansas in the summertime. And uh, so, but my parents took me to New York, and I saw the Rembrandt paintings in uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and that's when I decided I wanted to be a painter. Did you have any formal training? No, I had training only when I got to New York, after high school, I left Kansas in six, uh, when I was 17 by myself on train and went to New York and uh, didn't have any money, really, and, uh, but uh, got a scholarship at an art school. And then I got a Ford Foundation grant at the art school. So that paid me for the classes and my supplies. So I went to the Art Students League and uh, also the National Academy of Design up on 82nd Street. Uh, so, yeah, so that must have been pretty much of a shock when you got your draft notice. Y yes, because I had about $8,000 worth of commissions mm -hmm. to do down in Texas and in Denver, another store in Denver, mm -hmm. May DNF, uh, and uh, so... I, I belong to um, the, a very, uh, very um, difficult union to get into, which was the United Scenic Artists Union that did uh, all the backstage work for Broadway and TV, and they also did Epcot Center. And uh, so uh, you had to be uh, selected to be in that union because of the quality of your work, you just didn't 
get to join a union like most unions. You had to be qualified to be in the union. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I got drafted, I uh, decided I didn't want to go to where the Eastern Establishment soldiers were going down to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. So I applied for a uh, transfer to, to uh, somewhere where Kansans and Oklahomans and Texans went to, and that was Fort Bliss, Texas. So that's how I ended up at Fort Bliss, Texas. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you went through basic training? There. Yeah, very, very rigorous training there. Only half of our training uh, personnel, 120 soldiers, were able to make it through uh, physically and mental. Mm -hmm. uh, we had three attempted suicides. And we were uh, investigated by the inspector general for uh, the severity of our training. But it, I think it really was um, an idea they had that they wanted us to go through Marine Corps type training. Oh, okay. Because it was a wartime yes. situation. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So they weren't and then ready. at Fort Polk, it was that was supposed to be even worse, but that turned out to be uh, a piece of cake compared to boot camp okay. yeah so do you think the su suicides in your unit was were uh because the attempted suicides was, attempted yeah. suicides mm -hmm. were because it was so tough i think it was that and uh, a lot of soldiers were not uh expecting um uh, the type of training that but like i said uh I was able to get through it, and most uh, everybody else got through it. Uh -huh. But uh, I would say that it was an unusual situation. We, uh, like I said, it was probably more Marine Corps type training than traditional Army training because my father was in World War II, and he said that he didn't have to go through anything that like that. Yeah. All right, and so you ended up at Fort Polk, and mm -hmm. where did you go from there? Well, I got 30 days leave after Fort Polk, and so I went back to New York City to say goodbye to friends, and uh, I didn't expect to come back. We were told we were not coming back alive. Uh, we realized our drill instructors and the uh, sergeants that have were taking us out on uh, patrols in the in the swamps they were telling us what it was really like and what was our chances so we didn't really know as trainees until we got to Fort Polk and into the training there the uh, the severity of the situation yeah um, and then after your leave uh, what happened well, I went back to Denver to say goodbye to my folks, my brother, and I got on a plane, went to Oakland, California, and uh, was wait, ready to be shipped by um, airplane. Uh, uh, Flying Tigers was the name of the uh, company that flew us uh, over to uh, Southeast Asia. But we had to stop in Oakland. Um, Osaka, Japan, because we had to get around a typhoon. And then I, on the way down, I saw Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal from the air, uh, 30,000 feet. And then we uh, landed at uh, Cameron Bay. And, uh, and I was supposed to go to 4th Infantry Division, but the last moment they transferred me to 3 Corps, uh, which is north of Saigon. That would be... Um, the 25th Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, what did you do there? Well, we had a few days of uh, in-country training at the base camp. The mortars were coming in at night, so that was uh, kind of a new experience, to say the least, because uh, a mortar sounds pretty pretty loud far away, and, and later you, re you realize you didn't have to go into a bunker or anything if a mortar was hitting far away but to the new new soldiers it was kind of like an education 
beginning of an education of recognizing rounds, what they sounded like, and how far away they were coming, and this and that. Mm -hmm. Well, so then uh, I got my orders to go to the mechanized infantry at Dao Tang next to the Michelin rubber plantation, way up near the Cambodian border. That's where I, I started serving as uh, what I was trained to do as a rifleman and a machine gunner. And um, I uh, immediately um, took in all the sights that I could because you not only do you fly into this remote area, but you, 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 you're experiencing the tremendous heat and you're, and you're not sure what's going to happen to you. But then as soon as you get to your unit, you, you start to re realize that you're with a lot of uh, soldiers that are in the same situation you're in, but uh, they, they are much more experienced than you are. So you, uh, you're fortunate if you get into a platoon that has a good sergeant like I did, Sergeant K, who had been a Korean War veteran, and he had, a, he had an uncanny sense of where the enemy was out in the jungle. <clears throat> he saved our lives many times. In your role as a rifleman and a, a machine gunist, how did you how, how did you function with your unit? Uh, I did what uh, Sergeant K told me to do. Uh, he was very severe. There was no drugs or anything like that, like the movies and TV demean the American soldier in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. The reason for the, I'm saying that is because one soldier depended on another soldier. Uh -huh. to be awake and be conscious and be a full, on a full alert. And so you were, uh, sometimes you didn't have sleep for days and days, days and nights, uh, because you were attuned to trying to uh, stay uh, alert, to stay alive. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, at nighttime we went on ambush patrols, we went on at which was called listening posts, which you took a radio with two other soldiers and you you were way out there in the jungle uh, way ahead of everybody and you 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 listen you you were lying down behind the log all night long and you were listening for the enemy's footsteps mm -hmm. and uh there was uh hmm. that was scary yeah absolutely yeah uh is that pretty much what you did uh, uh, within your unit is, is go on out ahead of the other? We moved during the daytime, and we weren't allowed to ride the mechanized uh, tracks, which we called uh, uh, M113s or tracks. And they were, they were armored vehicle that had tracks and a 50 caliber machine gun on top but a uh, platoon sergeant wanted us to walk 20 meters to either side of the track to protect it and uh, we we were uh, very worried about a rocket propelled grenades because they could penetrate the the uh, the track the armor so if we were over to the side all the time walking we were sort of the first line of defense. And in the thick jungle, sometimes you couldn't see the person ahead of you, but he still wanted you to the side to try to pr protect the vehicles. We had, we had 20 armored personnel carriers in our company. And we went through the uh, Tricanopa jungle in column, that is in line. So the first track was the track that might get hit but the enemy couldn't form a an a, a, um, ambush too easy because we went through the jungle and we didn't go down the roads uh -huh. so we stayed in the jungles and that was called pushing jungle and that was because captain allison and sergeant k were aware that they knew what to do and they were very good uh, officers 
how often did you encounter the enemy? We encountered the enemy almost every day, whether it be a landmine that goes off or a mine in a tree that goes off or an outright uh, uh, fight, firefight. But our purpose was to locate and destroy enemy base camps way in the deep jungles like the Iron Triangle. And the northern part of the Iron Triangle was called the Trapezoid. And that's where we had a big engagement the last six days. And we finally, uh, with the help of Air Force and artillery, we, we overran that enemy base camp. And we were, that, that base camp was occupied by the 101st NVA um, unit, part of the 9th NVA division. And that turned out to be one of the biggest tunnel complexes that had ever been discovered. We never did find the extent of all the underground bunkers. But by the time the battle was over, the jungle looked like a World War I battlefield with no tree standing, just, just little toothpick-sized pieces of wood and bomb craters. And, of course, I... Was, uh, since I'd been a commercial artist, you might say, in New York, I was asked to do maps on the back of envelopes that were sent to headquarters. And uh, because of those envelope maps that I made while I was in the jungle, after we overran these enemy base camps, whether they were occupied or not, uh, I was approached by an officer one day saying, are you the person drawing these maps? And uh, uh, I said, uh, well, I didn't know anybody knew the, about these little drawings I'm doing. And the officer, he was a major, and he said, yes, they've been helping us at headquarters quite a bit. And he said, did you know there's an opening at 3rd Brigade headquarters for a draftsman? And I said, what's a draftsman? They said, well, he said that you draw maps. You know, you do the uh, drawings on the plastic sheets, which are called overlays, and the, then the, those maps that you make on the overlays are taken to headquarters at other divisions and other brigades. So they, they put those transparent markings over their map, mm -hmm. and that shows you where every unit is. Plus, uh, you had to, I found out later, you had to post the uh, colonel's map every night and also the map uh, at the underground uh, uh, headquarters bunker, which showed uh, where every ambush patrol was, where every battalion had, was located and where their ambush patrols were. So you had to know what the grid coordinates were and uh, I was selected to be the new brigade draftsman, and I did all the maps for the Tet Offensive. And uh, probably the most important drawing I've ever done in my life was the day that I had to do an overlay and show where 15,000 infantry were going to be landed by helicopter in a jungle clearing. And if I had misdrawn those marks, I could have got people killed. So I, to this day, I... I, although I've sold a lot of paintings and I've had a lot of success, I, I still think that that was the most important drawing I've ever done and will probably ever do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like it sure was. Mm -hmm. um, before, before we go on and talk about your experiences as a draftsman when you were still out in the jungle, um, I was just wondering uh, what kind of a casualty rate your unit experienced. Well, in the trapezoid battle, we lost half of our company, uh, wounded or killed. We had five killed. And how much? How many people were in your company? Oh, uh, probably about a hundred. Yeah. So uh, a lot of people, half were wounded, and uh, the battle lasted six days. And we went into the, we assaulted the enemy base camp, uh, you know, with, uh, we got within 100 feet of the enemy uh, trench line. And they were there. And they had, uh, uh, they had tunneled into uh, the termite nests. 
that stood above the ground maybe four or five feet. And so they shot at us from those termite nests too with RP RPG rounds, you know. Uh, you said you were a part of Operation Atlanta. Yeah, that, Is that was that what that was. That was part of Operation Atlanta. Okay. Yeah, included Thanksgiving, nineteen sixty-seven. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what uh, time period was it when you transferred to the draftsman position? It was uh, latter part of December. Of sixty-seven. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'd served in the front lines for three and a half months, and then I served at head brigade headquarters, and um, I uh, had several friends come down to visit me when they came back from their operations, and uh, they uh, I tried to get them jobs in the base camp. I tried to help my friends out to get uh, get out of the jungle, you know, uh, because. The strangest thing was I thought people would be embittered that I ended up at headquarters. That wasn't the case at all. When I was told to go to headquarters by the by the uh, company sergeant, uh, the uh, um, Sergeant Winkler, uh, people shook my hands. You know? Really? Yeah. There was no animosity at all. A few of them came down to visit me, and then I wanted them to try to get into a fire brigade at the base camp, you know, if there was an opening. I gave them right. tips on how to try to, to try to get to the base camp because it was a world that uh, was like night and day. Base camp, you had three meals a day. Yeah. You had bunker guard duty at night, of course, but uh, basically out in the jungle, you, you were lucky to have one meal a day. We were on the move all the time. We never had breakfast. You know, we had to have eat sea rations all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so that that's sort of a humorous story in itself. The, uh, the uh, ham and eggs, uh, I mean, not the ham and eggs, the lima bean, the B1A, or was it the B3? But it was awful. It was ha ham and lima beans. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine that and they're not heated they're cold but you take a little piece of c4 and you could heat up the can you know uh -huh. and you got the c4 out of a um a uh, one of the anti-personnel mines claymore mines you know, they would somehow you could share a little piece of c4 and light it with a match or something and uh -huh. It would burn real hot, uh -huh. and you could, that's the way you made your hot chocolate or coffee. Uh -huh. And some of the soldiers made pizza out of some of the sea ration bread <laughs> and Tabasco sauce, uh -huh. and, and <laughs> they were quite invent, innovative, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, because you had to be. <laughs> yeah, we only got once. Chinook would bring in a hot meal in the evening, but during the monsoon, uh, everything was wet, and rained, and rained, and the mud was everywhere, you know, and, and you didn't, we didn't get back to base camp for 35 or 40 days. So the socks just rotted off of you and your, your clothes were just disintegrating because of the mold and the, and the, the weather, you know, just you're soaking wet all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That sort of gives you an idea. What is I, the, not only that, but then the stress of the, uh, the fear uh, that the enemy was watching you all the time, which they were. And uh, so uh, they knew the terrain. And, uh, but we, uh, they didn't like our 50 caliber machine guns. That we dug in a lot. Sergeant K made us dig in a lot. We dug in the mud and we dug in the water. And he made us dig foxholes in the in the water, and and he he wanted us to be chest high with foxholes uh, all the time. And Constantino wire, he, we were working all the time digging in. Now I think that's why some of the other units got hit because they didn't they didn't go into a defensive posture. Their company commanders didn't you know weren't as strict as 
the ones I experienced. So I think that they, the enemy would not attack uh, a better defended position. They would attack a unit that was had not mm -hmm. taken the time to dig in mm -hmm. in the evening. That is, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, after you uh, transferred to your drafts draftsman position, mm -hmm. um, uh, could you tell us a little more about that? And was that during the tech? Offensive. Yes, it was before the Tet Offensive, before but, uh, the Tet Offensive. but I, uh, our Colonel, Colonel Dames, was uh, assigned by Westmoreland to be in charge of the uh, counter-offensive, uh, which the American Army uh, in the Three Corps uh, executed against the enemy during the Tet Offensive and after the Tet Offensive. So uh, my maps were crucial in because they went to other units. And so Dames, it was called Area of Operation, and the maps showed quite a significant large area. And there were other units in that area, so uh, the, all the maps showed where other units were. So that's how there was coordination was through the overlays and the maps. And where was your headquarters? Uh, Dao Tang, it was the old Michelin rubber plantation okay. headquarters. The French had been there. Uh, the French Four Legion had been there. Uh, I don't remember the name of the unit, but I was, uh, I was uh, you might say, privy to be in an area where the French Four Legion had served. Uh, in, on our patrol, sometimes we we saw uh, old trench lines that had been eroded where there had been previous conflicts and fighting going on. So there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, interest in my mind that we were sort of in a rather in interesting area because the Michelin rubber plantation was miles and miles of rubber trees. And uh, when you got in the rubber trees, there, they were. It was like in tunnels. The light did not show through the canopy, and water would be dripping off the leaves all the time. But the scariest thing was at night with the tarantulas and their big webs. And we'd go through, and they never bit anybody that I know of. But I often wondered what those big spiders were. But they were humongous, and the webs were like 12, 14 feet in width wow. and uh, we would have to walk through those spider webs mm -hmm. at night especially with no moon you couldn't see where they were yeah. and you knew there was a big spider up there in the corner of the web mm -hmm. but nobody ever got bit mm -hmm. uh, but uh, i saw those spiders and they were scary now i didn't know they were tarantulas at the time but i mm -hmm. saw in recent years i looked it up on the internet and those Vietnamese, they kill those spiders, and they eat them as a del delicacy. Now, I thought that was, that's not fair to those poor tarantulas. They didn't bite anybody. They were probably catching uh, maybe small insects or big insects and small birds, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, I would say the, the leg expansion was a good foot. Wow. That's how big they were. The wow. leg, ex, the leg diameter was on them. Yeah. Now that that doesn't, I that doesn't include the red ants. The red ants were highly, they stung you like wasp, and they were in, their nests were le in leaves, and if the track antenna hit one of those trees with a red ant nest in it, then the red ants came down on everybody and you you would never see people stripped off all their clothing so fast in all your life because of the red ants mm -hmm. uh, and there were snakes too snakes yeah <laughs> gosh and then the, the and then the creepiest thing was the leeches and they lived underground and they they were very they were like big um 
oh, they were like big night crawlers. And they'd uh, make a creaking sound when you were trying to sleep on the ground. Mm-hmm. Like if you had your poncho down mm-hmm. and you were had your head down and there'd be this creeping noise. Well, those were leeches mm-hmm. trying to get to you. Mm-hmm. And you know what a leech does. Yes. Sure do. <laughs> So those are a few stories. Yeah. yeah. So I do suffer from arachophobia now. Oh, I bet. I bet. Fear of spiders, uh-huh. yes. <laughs> I can imagine. Definitely. <laughs> uh, now, when you were making your maps as a draftsman, uh, how did you get the information to make? Well, I was, uh, I was given uh, a, a pattern or a, 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 you know, information that certain grid coordinates were going to be were um, Charlie Company, 3rd to 22nd leg unit, was going to be camped overnight. Okay. And so I'd look up the, you know, I'd look on the map, and then I'd see everything was in 1,000 meter squares. And then that's where your grid coordinates were at the top and the bottom and the side of the of the maps and then you would you would make those locations known and then you had to put a uh, draw a flag with a uh, an x on it which meant infantry and if it was mechanized infantry it was a flag with an x on it with a circle track circle sort of an oval circle in the center and that meant and then you put the in front of the flag you put the company uh uh, unit A, B, C, or D, and then you, at the bottom you would put the battalion, like 3rd or 22nd Infantry. And so you would mark every flag that you drew on the coordinate that was given to you to put on the maps. Mm-hmm. That had to be done every day. And and uh, let's see, how long were you in that, that position? I was there for... Uh, Sergeant, um, I'm sorry, General Gleason saw one of my paintings. See, I captured my own watercolors in one of these battles, went down in a tunnel, and there was a shaft of light coming from the roof. And in this room were seven boxes of praying watercolors and a roll of white paper. And that was their, uh, well, I guess it would be called propaganda room. Because when we went through some little villages like App 3 or App 4, there'd be a banner, you know, with uh, in between trees. And it might say, uh, with broken English, English, they were so poor at drawing these propaganda signs. It would say, uh, U.S. imperialist girlfriend home Cadillac, uh, go home, uh, you are. Uh, U.S. soldier, um, and then it'd be some Vietnamese word, and we couldn't make heads or tails of what they were trying to say. <laughs> they were putting everything but the kitchen sink. Yeah, they they would have uh, broken English uh, pieces of paper, and of course I found this roll of big paper uh-huh. that's butcher paper like, uh-huh. and then these watercolors were used for these signs. Well, I put all these watercolors in my pocket. Uh-huh. You know, I didn't take the paper. So I used those watercolor sets to do my drawings when I got to headquarters. Uh-huh. And General Gleason saw one of my paintings and uh, recommended me for a uh, combat artist at the 25th Division headquarters, which was uh, part of the Pentagon 18th Military Historical Detachment. And what that unit did, there was only one major and one secretary, male secretary, and they would do after action reports every day on what happened with the whole division, 25,000 troops. They would make a synopsis, write up a synopsis every day. It was called an after action report, whether there was a battle or whether there wasn't. Well, they used uh, the paintings for the help uh, communicate or show what had happened. So uh, I, but my Sergeant Major Pendleton, who was in the Korean War, he wouldn't let me go. So I had to do my drawings and take them down to Kuchi by Caribou, which was about 120 miles flight. 
and I'd get to go take the day off and get down there and 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 give my drawings to Major Baum and he uh, was from the Pentagon and then they put my work in some of their publicity books and then I extended two months so I was over there 14 months total and I extended to go to Kuchi and be a part of that in oh, person. Okay. So you spent two months there. Yeah, two months there. Mm -hmm. Coochie was a big base camp. That was division headquarters. And uh, that was like going from, uh, uh, oh, some rural Kansas town to Kansas City. It was that much of a change. You can imagine you could get food and things that were, instead of eating uh, instant scrambled eggs, you were eating, uh, well, they, they actually had ice cream there. Yeah. I didn't have a hamburger and a malt for 10 months. Yes. But when I got down to Tansanut, Tansanut Air Force Base, I got, I drove my command, the command track and uh, my, guy friend who was riding shotgun we pulled right up in front of the uh the air force uh mess hall and we were surrounded <laughs> <laughs> by air force guys who never been outside the wire and they wanted to know whether i had an ak-47 for a sale oh. <laughs> <laughs> so went in there and had a malt and a hamburger uh -huh. And that was after 10 months. <laughs> you have no idea how good that tasted. Uh, I can imagine. <laughs> oh, Even though it was probably water buffalo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, um, can you tell us about your worst day in Vietnam? Well, I think the worst day, worst worst day was when um, it, well there were several days of course they were when friends got killed you know I had uh, especially like David Ditch who I tried to help he came down to visit me he had a premonition he was going to get killed and I told him that well go over to the uh, fire, uh, fire department at the base camp and see if there's an opening there for you. Because, see, there are people derosing, leaving. Yeah. They've done their 12 months, and then there's got to be a position filled. And if you were lucky enough, like I was lucky, you know, same thing happened to my father in World War II. He knew how to speak French and write French, so he ended up being a censor. And uh, he was designated to be in the Normandy landings. And he was uh, trained as a, a forward observer. His life expectancy was zilch. Uh, but my father uh, lucked out uh, in that way. And, uh, and, uh, and, I, uh, and he was at Fort Polk 25 years to the day I was at Fort Polk. Mm -hmm. And he was drafted sort of a strange coincidence isn't it of all the places and all how many years had passed and uh, I sort of followed in, in his footsteps just by by coincidence mm -hmm. I had no pull I didn't know anybody special you know but yet I became brigade draftsman picked uh, out of 5,000 infantrymen you know so, uh, but I, I go to the reunions and we're, we're, we're just like brothers. We just have a great time, you know, and the bad memories are, are lost. I guess most veterans really compartmentalize things like that. I think that's human nature, but basically when I lost a friend, that was my worst days, you know, and, and I was with one that got, uh, John Gibson. Uh, he uh, was 18 years old. I was 23. I was an old man uh, compared to the other soldiers I served with. My squad leader, Jim Frost, he was 19 years old. And uh, we're still very good friends. 
Um, but John Gibson, uh, he got a Dear John letter. One of my paintings depicts this subject in my book, your Vietnam War paintings, uh, narratives by participants. And uh, I spent $11,000 uh, having this book published myself because uh, the publisher said he'd be able to sell it in six months, all 2,000 copies. But turned out the Army PXs didn't want my book because of politics, you know, during the Clinton years, everything was supposed to be forgotten about Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So uh, w my wife and I, we had a lot of art shows back east, and I'm in like 14 military museums permanently, mm -hmm. and I've done, I've been able to have my work in a lot of publications, including a recent one um, uh, by the VFW, Brutal Battles of Vietnam War, and I'm the only painting in it, so that was quite an honor. But but see, Ch John Gibson, he got a Dear John letter a uh, day before he was killed, and uh, he came over to me in the foxhole. We were both in foxholes, and he said, I got just got a Dear John letter. I said, well, a lot of guys get Dear, Dear John letters. I said, oh. Uh, what, what do you need? He said, well, I want to change my $10,000 life, in life insurance policy to my parents. I don't want my wife to get it. And so what do I do? And I said, well, go back and talk to Captain Allison back in the middle of the jungle clearing there where he was. And uh, he came back and I said, John, what did he say? He said, well, I have to write a letter. And I, when we get back to base camp, I got to fill out a form. Well, he was killed the next day. So his wife, who had abandoned him, got the money. But here, um, two months ago, I got a call from Cap Bill Allison down in Montgomery, Alabama. He said, Jim, do you have a photograph of Chuck Gibson, uh, John Gibson? I said, well, why? He says, because uh, there's a Marine in northern uh, Missouri and uh, he said that John's name has never been put on the county memorial in his hometown and he found out about him so and he said also john has a 50 year old daughter that's never had a picture of her father i said you're kidding me when john got killed his wife was expecting and they he has a 50 year old daughter and he said that's right he said maybe you could call up this number and help him out and i said well i think i got a photograph well i i looked i called up the Bill, that's his name in northern Missouri, and he explained the situation. He hadn't been able to find the daughter. He didn't know where the daughter lived, but they told him at the courthouse she would live somewhere in Missouri. So uh, I looked for the slide I had, and uh, I couldn't find it. And I called him back, and I said, I've looked for this slide, and I don't know where it is. Well, I came in from the field one day, I was farming, doing something, disking or something, and I saw this slide on the edge of my dining room table, and I looked at it, and it was the picture I was looking for. So I came down here, Slina, had a had a, a nice conversion uh, out there at uh, the mall and had it converted to a photograph, and then I sent it off to them, and she finally got a picture of her father, a wonderful picture of her. And uh, so... Um, that evidently there's going to be some sort of ceremony uh, down the road at his high school Absolutely. in his hometown, and I think I'll make the trip. Absolutely. Yeah, but Absolutely. yeah. Well, uh, now that now, if you could tell us about your best day in Vietnam, the best day. Uh -huh. Well, that was leaving. Leaving, of course. Yeah. And then the second best day was having that hamburger and that, <laughs> at Thompson Air Force Base. Uh -huh. <laughs> but no, uh, you know, when you got to leave, uh, that was like getting out of prison. That's the only comparison I can think of. Uh, how how did you how did you leave Vietnam and come home? I went to uh, I went to 
uh, headquarters, of course, I was there, so I checked in some of my equipment, and then I got down to Camp Alpha at Long Bend, and they, that's where I turned in my rifle and uh, flak jacket and uh, helmet, and uh, we were given um, uh, khaki, khaki outfit, and, uh, and that's... Um, we came back to the States uh, in a khaki uniform and uh, landed at Oakland. It was like a 13-hour trip, you know, and um, they, the, the, the stewardesses were really nice gals, and they were cheerful, and it was, it was really uh, wonderful just to see an American a gal again. And, uh, and they were, they were really, they were asked you a lot of questions and stuff and, and, um, they'd serve you, you know, food and, and they had a movie, of course, and everything was just really a lot of fun coming back. It was a big relief, but in retrospect, I don't regret serving at all. I'd do it all over again. But uh, but I was tired, mm. and also I was not well. I and as soon as I got to Oakland, I had to check into the naval hospital because I had bad trench foot on my feet, and they couldn't seem to cure it. And I w stayed two weeks in the uh, VA hospital out by Golden Gate Bridge, and they put something on my legs, and it just took the hide right off of me. Mm. Took two weeks to heal. And, uh, of course, I got to meet some of the other soldiers there that were wounded. And the worst of ones, the worst situation was the guys that had malaria mm -hmm. and couldn't get over the malaria. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a whole ward of, of uh, soldiers that had malaria. Mm -hmm. So uh, I rode the train back to Denver, and then I went to the Denver Skin Clinic, and they had called in a a doctor who had been in World War II in the South Pacific, and he knew exactly what to do. And they, he had some powder he put on me, and I started feeling better right away. And he said, Nelson, he said, you're lucky. He said, I said, why? He says, because this has got in your blood. If you hadn't come to us, you would have been, you would have died from it. But it got into my blood, and I was losing weight. You know, I'm just, I was really emaciated, but it was because of that that bacterial infection mm -hmm. that was getting in my blood, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got, uh, started feeling really good in two weeks. And, mm -hmm. and so then I bought a ticket to, uh, to uh, Europe on a flew over to Europe, spent six months in Europe traveling around, ended up in Spain mm -hmm. down there. Yeah, where it's warmer. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm glad I did that. But I, I, I spent all my money, and then I got back to New York on a freighter from Lisbon, Portugal, and I decided I wasn't going to stay in New York anymore. All my friends had gone away, and <coughs> they didn't like Vietnam veterans there at all. That was the hotbed of the Jane Fonda movement oh. and all that, you know. You didn't mention you were in Vietnam back in New York. Matter of fact, you didn't want to mention it here in Kansas, too. The Osborne VFW wouldn't even let a Vietnam veteran join. Yeah. I'm not making that up. It's true. So um, I decided to come back here and start life all over again. I got to Boyd with 50 cents in my pocket. Mm -hmm. I went up to my aunt's house, walked up there. My brother's old car was sitting out behind the garage, and <clears throat> I got a battery for it and drove out to the farm. All the pipes were broken, but it was sure glad. It was like home, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Is that good... where you still live? Now? Yeah, yeah, still there. I'm fifth generation uh -huh. there. But uh, it uh, people were not sympathetic here 
uh, they'd been brainwashed by the media, which was anti-American soldier in served in Vietnam, and um, and that didn't change until the Persian Gulf Persian Gulf War, where um, the soldiers were treated to a parade when they came back. You know, then I think the American public started to relate to the Vietnam veteran in relation to the Gulf War veteran and why was it the Vietnam veteran was demonized by the media and the movies and the you know just we were we were portrayed as drug addicts and matter of fact uh, that was the rumor at Jewel when I came back I was a Vietnam veteran on drugs oh. you know people said that I found that out from a friend of mine but, uh, and then uh, I couldn't win. I was, I ran for office. I couldn't win as a vet veteran. Yeah. In 76, I ran for state legislature yeah. and I wanted lower taxes, mm -hmm. but uh, they didn't want to elect a veteran, a Vietnam veteran. Mm -hmm. well, that must have been very difficult to. It was a big, that. a big disappointment for oh, me. Yeah. yeah I, I was disappointed, and uh, but that's uh, that's when my the road divided, and I took the road on more paintings. Yeah. Uh, yes. Otherwise, I would have been in politics. Well, tell us tell us about your Vietnam paintings. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Obviously, you must have painted a lot of what you remembered from Vietnam. Well, I, I, it is not therapeutic what I do. It's totally historical. Mm -hmm. uh, I, tr I try to cr chronicle the war mm -hmm. and from my own vantage point. That was multiple vantage points, front line, uh, worm's eye view, and then headquarters. Uh, I had a unique uh, experience in that way. And so it wasn't until about 1996, I went to a reunion of a sister battalion. Me and my wife went to a, union, a reunion in, in St. Louis, Missouri. And a, a young, young fellow, well, young, he was in his 50s, probably like I was. And he'd, uh, he was writing a book on fire support base gold. And, uh, and, uh, he was, his company was overrun. He was one of the few survivors in the company. So his life had stopped there. But it, so he's writing this book and he's doing a, going to great lengths to get photographs from everybody and calling up families of those who were killed or wounded and, and visiting survivors and fellow comrade in arms. And he, uh, he, He's writing this book, and he says, uh, could you paint me a picture of, of the battle? I said, yeah, that'd be great. I said, I love doing historical paintings, you know. So I worked on this painting six months. It's now located at the Department of Veterans Affairs in Albany, New York, in their gallery. It purchased by the state of New York, and it, uh, it's a mural 12 feet by 6 feet has 64 figures in it and it's pretty got published recently and by the VFW in their new book Brutal Battles of Vietnam it, they actually featured my painting and uh, that was one of the first paintings I did and it became so uh, well known the painting that uh, the uh, the military museum at Branson, Missouri, wanted to show it uh, and have a reproduction of it. Uh, the original paintings up in New York, uh, Albany, New York. But I uh, did some reproductions for the Branson Museum, and from there, other military museums wanted my work. Mm -hmm. So I have a painting, like in the Infantry Museum at. Fort Benning, Georgia, a new museum there. And we had to take that to Fort Riley, and they put the painting in a connex and 
shipped it down there themselves, you know. And so I've actually made a little niche in military painting. I'm not, I'm not, you know, famous or anything like that, but I have made a mark with my work, which I feel in my own lifetime is an accomplishment. And then I just got a commission from a Vietnam veteran in Los Angeles. He wants me to paint a picture for him of him, of himself. And, uh, I get commissions all over. I, these soldiers, veterans are calling me up or writing me and they want a painting, and I do it. Uh, because I was there, I, I want to honor them yeah. for their service. I want to do it in a, realist, in a realistic uh, style, which I was trained, mm -hmm. you know, in New York. I didn't, I didn't train into non-objective painting, which was a ripoff to the, art investor and uh so i i i my idea was try to study classical realism so my paintings are basically in in the i try to paint in the dutch school like rembrandt but i can i can do a lot of other color schemes i have a lighter color scheme but uh i've my drawing has improved a lot over the years so you know, I think I'm produ I'm producing a good product, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's and I'm trying to do the best I can to make it accurate. You know, and to and to show the way it really was. Mm -hmm. And if I can show it the way it really was, then I feel that the painting is a success. Yeah. Uh, well. Uh... Is there anything else you would like to add about your about your Vietnam related experiences? Well, I would like to say that uh, in conclusion, I guess if this is the conclusion of the interview, uh, the best people I ever knew, the nurses and the and the soldiers that I knew in Vietnam were the best people I ever met in my life. I've met a lot of people since Vietnam, but I. I realized a number of decades later that, you know, I was looking at uh, meeting people and served with people that answered the call. Mm -hmm. They were the true patriots. And I feel sorry they were so mistreated over the decades. Yeah. But I blame the media for that. Well, you must feel fortunate to have served with them. Yes, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 uh, good feeling that I did uh, do do the best I could you know and I tried to do the best I could and I'm still trying to do the best I can with my paintings on that subject matter well uh, I guess we will conclude the interview and it's been a pleasure speaking with you well it's likewise and, thank you and uh, I mm -hmm. do want to thank you for your service both in Vietnam and in mm -hmm. documenting and honoring the people. And I appreciate this line of public library for having a show of my work here a few a months ago. Show. We we had a large turnout. We did. You know? It was wonderful. I heard people came in since it was here a month. I heard there were oh, quite yeah. a few people came oh, in yeah. to see it. It drew a lot of uh -huh. people, a lot of interest, and I think everyone appreciated your. I, I only regret that my wife wasn't with me, but she passed away four years ago. And uh, she was one, one of my big cheerleaders. I feel a lot of it, it I owe to her, Sharon. 